Thank you, Zoe, for that very, very nice introduction. Overly nice. The best part of it to me was learning that I will, in fact, complete the book I'm supposed to get done. <laughs> you said it's coming out this year. That was great news to me. Very encouraging. Um, it's great to be here. Um, and uh, so I particularly liked uh, Zoe's um, vote of confidence for civil recourse theory. The talk that I'm going to give today is not going to be about civil recourse theory, although it lies in the background, I'd say. Um, this is a talk on real live tort cases that I personally find extremely interesting. And since I knew it was a broad audience and I would wanted to write about these cases anyway, that's what I'm going to talk about. They're mostly American <laughs> cases, uh, but in the end I'm going to talk a little bit about English and Canadian cases too. Okay. Um, so basically what I want to talk about is um, th the a change of the law in the United States that pertains to defamation law when it's online. Um, I'm going to argue that certain changes that have taken place um, have been a catastrophe and were based on a blunder by judges. Um, not all of my talk is of the sort of smarty pants law professor spirit about how judges are getting everything wrong, but most of it is. Um, okay, so um, I don't know how much you folks study uh, libel law in the first year of torts, but uh, part of this talk is about something called the republication rule in libel law. And the republication rule basically says um, that even if somebody else first made this a certain statement. Um, B said, even if B said X is a child molester, if Zapersky uh, reports that B said X is a child molester, uh, then Zapersky is on the hook as if he were B. And that um, would apply to both slander and libel and probably it's most um, it's not identical to, but it's very closely related to uh, the basic idea that if a newspaper publishes an article by somebody, even if that person is not an agent or employee of the newspaper, the fact that somebody else wrote it and not the newspaper or its staff is kind of irrelevant for libel law. The newspaper has published it. Okay? In this sense, the, there is something a little odd about the republication rule. Um, because it's kind of the opposite of what the common law does in an area like evidence, where if it's hearsay, it's categorically of a different quality, right, and doesn't get treated the same. We do the opposite in libel law, and it's, I think it's for um, a not very surprising set of reasons. One is that the reputational harm can be as great or often greater of the republication. Another is you don't publish something unless you intentionally act. It's, it's an act. So it doesn't seem unfair in a sense to have that potential liability. Uh, uh, another uh, very big set of reasons is that it would be very easy for people to sidestep liability if there weren't a republication where you just always attribute the statement to somebody else. Um, so it's a pretty standard, pretty important rule. Um, so. I believe that what's happened in the United States is um, that for online statements, the republication rule has suddenly been sort of sheared away. It doesn't really exist um, for many, many areas of the internet. If somebody else wrote it and I post it, I don't face any potential liability, uh, which to me is a, a shocking state of affairs. Uh, and also, as a number of scholars in a number of areas have pointed out, um, I think the internet is extremely damaging, uh, particularly to women, but in a variety of political and personal ways that we've seen escalate into suicides and various kinds of things. So the un unregulated quality of the internet and of 
reputational and privacy damage done on the internet strikes me as a pretty important practical policy problem right now. I'm obviously focusing just on one little piece of it, which is that in American jurisdictions, the republication rule has essentially been pulled away, uh, most, most American jurisdictions. And so um, the, the issue has never reached the United States Supreme Court, uh, not yet, but virtually all of the important um, appellate courts below the Supreme Court that have addressed it have come out the same way, the same eliminate the republication rule way. Uh, I'm going to focus on one case, a very interesting case uh, from the Ninth Circuit from California called Batzel versus Smith. So here's what happens in Batzel. Uh, Batzel is a woman who practices tax law both in California and North Carolina, mainly in California, but she actually has a house in Asheville, North Carolina. She hires a handyman to do some work for her in this house. Um, some kind of dispute comes up, which I've never really fully figured out. Anyway, bad blood, so to speak, arises between Batsell and this handyman, Smith. And Smith um, sends an email to an art security expert uh, and a stolen art expert who runs a website. And lives, he lives in Amsterdam, and the guy's name is Kramers. Okay, now what this email says is, I've been working for this woman, Batso, who lives in North Carolina. I've found out some interesting stuff about her. I believe she, she is the granddaughter of Heinrich Himmler. And there's a lot of uh, old art stored in her house with these old wooden frames. And I believe that this is art that was looted from the Jews during the Second World War that... Um, Batzel has. That's what he sends. And then this guy, Kramer's, uh, this is the uh, looting picture I found on the internet, but it's probably not that. But um, then Kramer's posts it around the world on art security, uh, on, on large, and a newsletter that he runs, and also he emails it to various people. She doesn't realize this is happening. Batesel doesn't realize until a variety of things happen. So people start threatening her life in North Carolina. And uh, a variety of her clients, particularly Jewish clients, decide that she's no longer going to be their lawyer. She has no idea why any of this is going on until she finds out that this um, completely false defamatory statement has been posted around the world about her. So she um, sues. Um, Smith, uh, the handyman, who's pr probably pretty much insolvent. She also sues Kramers, the art security expert, um, who posted it around the world. It, it had been just a letter or a single email to Kramers. Um, Kramers uh, argues that, um, hold on one second. So Kramers argues that um, there should be no liability in this case because there's a federal statute called the Communications Decency Act that was um, uh, passed in 1996. And Kramers argues that that protects him from liability. Let's see if you can see it. So at the bottom it says, the statute says, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. That's what this statute says. Uh, and um, the, this, the, basically the bottom line is that the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, a panel of three judges, agreed with Kramers. The plaintiff argued the, um, this can't be right. Um, that only involves uh, internet service providers not having an obligation to remove things from the internet. It has nothing to do with people reposting things on the internet. And the court said um, there's no place, there's nothing but any active passive distinction that's in the statute. There's no basis for that. 
and therefore you're wrong, and um, basically you fit a right in the statute. So here's the language, such a distinction between deciding to publish only some of the material submitted and deciding not to publish. In other words, a distinction between posting um, and taking down is not tenable and it's not in the statute, therefore no liability. Um, and Batesel has been followed by the California Supreme Court, the New York Court of Appeals, the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and numerous other district courts. I've never seen any court that has pushed away from Batesel on this issue now. Um, so uh, the bottom line is that the republication rule is essentially gone. If you get uh, a defamatory email from somebody else and you want to post it on some massive website in the United States without changing it, without adding things to it yourself, you want to repost it or send it around, it looks like in the overwhelming majority of jurisdictions no liability for sending that around, even though I think it's obvious that it fantastically amplifies the potential damage that is done. So um, the first question I, I wanted to, to ask, and really the main question, is how did this happen? Did Congress really pass such a law? Is that what this law means? How is it that courts have read the law this way? Now, um, anyone who studied uh, with Weinreb will know, for example, that it's going to be very tempting for me to run an argument that part of the problem is that America is American judges and legal scholars are caught up with legal realism and they don't believe in things like active <laughs> passive distinctions and that is in fact part of my story. Uh, but there's a bigger story that I, I want to tell particularly in light of last night's Academy Awards ceremony. So um, the question arose in the beginning of the 1990s um, what are we going to do about defamation on the internet? If somebody posts something on a bulletin board on America Online uh, or, or some other internet service provider, um, and are they going to be liable or not? How should that be analyzed? That was a big question. And um, so the first case was a case from New York City, from the federal court in New York City in the Southern District of New York, Cubby versus CompuServe. Um, and the court in that case said that basically CompuServe was, was carrying a whole bunch of electronic periodicals and the plaintiff's complaint was that one of these electronic periodicals contained a defamatory statement. And the judge in that case granted a summary judgment to CompuServe saying, look, CompuServe is functioning like a library here. It's not actually like a newspaper publisher. It's functioning like a library. And libraries are not on the hook as publishers, um, at least not if they don't have notice. And there was no notice in this case. Now, the next case um, uh, was a lawsuit against Prodigy, uh, which in the early 90s was an online service provider that advertised that it was family friendly and that you could get it for your whole family and that they weren't going to let all kinds of smut onto their uh, uh, um, get through to your kids because they were filtering and they were censoring and they were taking responsibility for this. That's what Prodigy said as part of a big marketing campaign. And um, so when a large securities firm that was quite controversial in um, New York um, had a statement on a prodigy supported electronic bulletin board that said that they were um, financial fraudsters um, and they sued, um, the plaintiff in that case was in a good position to say, you don't get to deny responsibility. You don't get to say you're a mere library. You've held yourself out as being able to control content and therefore you are on the hook. You are a newspaper publisher. And in fact, the plaintiff securities firm in that case was so aggressive that it moved for partial summary judgment and the judge unfortunately bought it. And he ruled against Prodigy that as a matter of law, Prodigy was a publisher because it had held itself out as doing all this kind of censorship. Now, interestingly, the plaintiff in this case was Stratton Oakmont. Uh, uh, and um, uh, 
which was in fact engaging in fantastic amounts of financial fraud, probably far more than the person who posted on the bulletin board had said. And this is a movie that is, this was made into the movie The Wolf of Wall Street. Finally got an Academy Award last <coughs> night for uh, a different movie. Um, but um, Stratton Oakmont was the firm uh, that Jordan Belfort wrote, of, that he ran, and he wrote The Wolf of Wall Street about. So it deserved everything bad about its reputation. But um, this very strong pro-plaintiff mindset um, uh, was now on the board. This big case said, Prodigy, you are a publisher. You can be sued just like your newspaper. So what happens next? Well, this is um, the Western world, the United States, the internet industry runs down to Washington, D.C., all upset about what has happened to it. Clinton was the president then, and um, there were the Congress was in the middle of negotiating a big telecommunications bill that was about all kinds of things. And they said, look, you want us to make the internet clean, but you've got a judge out there in New York who says if you offer to the public to filter, then you're liable for everything anybody publishes. So that's a complete catastrophe. You need to change that if you want us to help you make the internet clean. And the argument, unsurprisingly, succeeded in flying colors. And so they inserted something um, into, uh, for protection for Good Samaritan blocking and screening of offensive material. It's, and this is Communications Decency Act 230C uh, 1 and 2. So the first part is this language you've seen before. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. And so that's what this guy Kramers was arguing. He was saying that I'm a user of an interactive computer service. I'm not a supplier, but the statutory text doesn't say it has to be a provider. You could be a user. I'm a user. Um, you want to hold me liable for republishing something. You want to treat me as a publisher of what this guy Smith sent me. But all of the information, maybe I took out a few little punctuation marks, but all of the information was provided by him. So I'm off the hook. And that's the argument that succeeded. Um, now, interestingly and importantly, in my view, as we'll come to the second part of this, C2 talks uh, more specifically in ways that uh, uh, make reference to what happened in Prodigy. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be held liable on account of any action voluntarily taken to restrict access, um, and basically to filter um, from this. And, and that was, was part of it, OK? So that's the statute. Obviously, what happened by the time we get to the Batesel case and the whole realm of cases eliminating the republication rule is that the statute has been interpreted in a broad way. So what I'm going to talk about now is the, the very famous case called Zarin, very interesting case from um, Virginia, uh, which interpreted it broadly. Now, just so I'm not too confusing, I'm actually going to agree with the very broad interpretation of the statute that this Virginia court reached. It's just the step beyond that I'm going to disagree with, so, so that I'm not too confusing. OK? Uh, so this case you know, falls in the category of you can't make this stuff up, which is why I like torts so much and why I wanted to talk to you about real cases rather than theory mostly today, OK? So here's what happens. The case happens six days after the, the, the central event in this case occurs six days after terrorists, domestic terrorists in the United States blew up a federal building in Oklahoma City. Lots and lots of people were killed, hundreds of people, including, I think, dozens of children who were in a daycare center in the federal building in Oklahoma. Okay. Six days afterwards, on, uh, um, through an American online 
bulletin board, a posting is put up as follows. It says, hey, are you interested in buying some t-shirts? Uh, I have t-shirts. I'm happy to sell t-shirts about Oklahoma City. Visit Oklahoma. It's a blast. And this one says, the black one says, finally a daycare center that keeps the kids quiet. And then it said, if you want to buy some of these t-shirts, call, call Ken at, and then it gives a phone number. Well, the, the phone number is a phone number of someone in, in uh, Oregon, I think, named Ken Zarin, the plaintiff here, who had nothing to do with this. This was a prank on Ken Zarin. Make him seem bloodthirsty and totally offensive, and there were more shirts. And um, so sure enough, he got thousands of people, thousands of calls a day from angry people about how offensive this was. And people, radio station in Oklahoma City picked up that what this guy, Ken, was supposedly doing. <coughs> and he, his life was threatened. This went on for He contacted AOL and asked them to take it down. And they said, no, they didn't, they didn't take this down until he finally filed a, a lawsuit against them. And then they finally took it down. So basically, he's suing for def I think technically he's sued for negligence. But it's clear that what he's suing for is the reputational harm inflicted upon him by First, this prankster, and then AOL, because it had control of whether it could take it down, and it didn't. So, of course, AOL argues um, that, um, that, it's, that it's protected by uh, the Communications Decency Act. Um, and um, let me see if I can find the, the um, give you, go back to the text for a sec. Yeah. So, it basically argued that if you held AOL liable for this, for the reputational harm, you would be violating this provision here. And um, Zarin had a really interesting comeback. Zarin's comeback was, no, that's wrong, actually, because what the statute means is that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher, meaning like the newspaper publisher. So the standard of liability for newspaper publishers, as you probably know, is pretty strict. The standard of liability for a library or a bookstore um, is not so strict. It's notice-based liability. And um, it, it's what Zarin argued is, we're not doing strict liability here for AOL. They had notice. We think they were negligent because even after they, we gave them notice, they did nothing to take it down. And so this is not relevant. And a uh, famous, very conservative uh, uh, federal judge, Harvey Wilkinson III in the Fourth Circuit, uh, for a unanimous panel of three on the Fourth Circuit, went with AOL and not with the plaintiff. They said, you know, this distinction between publisher and distributor, it's a very nice distinction, but we have no evidence that Congress was focused upon them. They were focused on bigger policy goals. Uh, they didn't want the internet to be hampered by too much liability. They actually declared that in the text of the statute. They declared some of the legislative history about their, their goals, and they thought it was wildly unreasonable to have liability for failure to take down. They had, they had really no concept of the nuance of publisher versus distributor. That's not what they were doing. And so we're not going to read it narrowly. We're going to read it broadly. OK? Um, now, I, I myself, having studied the legislative history and also looking at how incredibly thin the doctrinal, American doctrinal um, law is on publisher versus distributor and how irrelevant it seemed to me to have been to Congress when it did this, uh, I, I think that Judge Wilkinson was right. Um, so this strikes me as a case that should have won at the common law, given how long AOL delayed, probably. Uh, but given that the statute is there, I think this court got it right. Um, now, um, the problem is um, that the statute doesn't make any reference to active versus passive. It doesn't use those words, active versus passive. And this guy, um, 
Kramer's and Batesold versus Smith had a pretty good argument that he comes within the, that he comes within this. Uh, but what I want to try to argue for you um, today and in the next few minutes is that what the Ninth Circuit did dis displayed by, by pushing Zarin one step further, displayed really a complete failure to understand what's going on in the statute. So um, the first thing to see is that defamation law, whether libel or slander, basically, but, but, but it's particularly clear with libel, which is what we're dealing with, draws a distinction between authors and publishers. There, it's, it's just a different thing. Liability isn't for being an author. In fact, if you write something and you only give it to the person you're defaming, there's just no tort. It's for getting to, it's, it's for taking some message, whether you've written it or not, and putting it in the face of third parties so that their view of the plaintiff is now worse than it was. That is the idea, okay? And so being an author is neither necessary nor sufficient uh, for, for being a publisher. It's a different, it's a bit different concept, okay? Now what is generally important is um, that the, it's, it's essentially um, an intentional tort uh, uh, libel. It's like a reputational bop on the head. You need to be doing something, that you're putting something out there that um, is an attack on someone's reputation. Um, and that's what the restatement of torts says. Publication of defamatory, um, matter is its communication intentionally or uh, by negligent act to one other than the person defamed, but it's by an act. Now it turns out, if you look at the common law of libel, there are uh, two basic ways of expanding the pool of potential defendants here. Uh, one way is by expanding who counts as doing the act. So, and, and originally, in a not very free speech respecting part of English history, the printers, the guys who would actually put the plates down uh, uh, on the printing press could be pulled in for libel too because they were part of the causal process. In the late 19th century, the, the English courts softened up on that. Um, but you get the picture. Who's part of the process of bringing it forward? So you could expand the misfeasance. And another way to do it is to, um, and this is the expanding the misfeasance. Um, and it expands it, but it puts in a uh, notice requirement. Um, another way to do it, though, is by um, creating what, to my mind, is the, the equivalent of an affirmative duty to remove. So partly, even though it's an intentional tort, we're partly looking at something that is analogous to the way negligence law is structured and that misfeasance and not feasance are treated differently. But be, just because that's the case, it doesn't mean that there's no place where the courts would find within the domain of non-feasance where they'd ratchet up an affirmative duty to do something, to protect somebody from the problem. And we actually have some case law in libel law where there are situations where you have an affirmative duty to remove. And under the restatement second, it basically says, um, if you own the property uh, on which somebody is displaying a defamatory message, um, and you know it, you know that they are, uh, it may be that there's liability for failure to remove it under certain circumstances, okay? So these are the two categories we have, and um, there's this wonderful old English case called Byrne versus Dean um, that um, is the origin of the duty to remove case, and uh, I don't know if any of you know Byrne versus Dean, but what happens is there's a beautiful uh, country club with a golf course, uh, and this is in the 30s, and they have some um, slot machines, gambling machines that are illegal in the little clubhouse. But they all enjoy it. And uh, uh, what happens is that uh, the cop, the police show up someday and take it all away. 
and they were, people are very upset about it. Well, that's what happened there. And in the spot where they had the slot machines in the clubhouse, someone anonymously posted a little verse. And this is the verse, for many years upon the spot, you heard the sound of a merry bell, those who were rash and those who were not lost and made a spot of cash. But he who gave the game away, may he burn in hell and rue the day. And the word burn, spelled that way, was crossed out and B-U-R-N was written over it. Well, there was a member of the club named Mr. Byrne who interpreted this as an assertion that he was the snitch. <coughs> Okay, so he sued um, the people who owned the clubhouse for failing to take down this piece of paper that was supposedly defamatory of him. Um, and I think the lower court uh, ruled that there was no publication, uh, but in any event, all three judges on the Court of Appeal uh, ruled that um, theoretically, there could be, there was a publication here, but it turns out it was dicta because as many of you know, uh, reporting on a crime, even though it can hurt someone among his or her peers, uh, is generally not viewed to be defamatory because we all have duties to report on wrongdoings. So it's dicta in Byrne versus Dean, but it's, fam it's famous English dicta that there could be publication under these circumstances, okay? So, why do I tell you all this? Um, here's, here's my view of uh, the structure of the doctrine that we, when Stratton Oakmont got to the New York court, was facing legal scholars, judges, lawyers, right? Um, you, you could treat somebody as a full-fledged author or publisher, um, in which case there's kind of a strict liability. You could treat them like a library or distributor, which is more attenuated, but if there's some kind of notice, you could have it. If it's a property owner, you need actual notice, and there's possible liability. And if you were just a common carrier, and there are cases like this where one person calls another, and um, says something defamatory about a third person, and the plaintiff sues the phone company. <laughs> yes, I mean, there are people who do that, and saying that you were part of the causal process of the defamation, because they would never have been, a, you were part of the machinery of the communication. And the courts say, no, you can't do that. Common carrier isn't good enough for being part of the causal process. So what was going on at the beginning of the 90s is courts were trying to find their way through all of this. If it was just a common carrier, there should be no liability at all. Um, if it's a distributor, it's one standard. If it's a property owner, maybe there will be on notice. It just wasn't clear and it was overwhelming that there were gonna be thousands and now we know millions and hundreds of millions of messages every day. And so, um, essentially, what the lawyers for Stratton Oakmont did is they sidestepped all of this by doing something that is very familiar to us from negligence law. What they said is, look, we don't have to make this big difficult distinction because you have an affirmative duty to remove based on the fact that you undertook to filter and to censor. It's a very standard, sensible kind of common law argument around uh, no liability for nonfeasance rule, right, if you undertake it. Um, so that's what Stratton Oakmont was about. It wasn't about figuring out which place to put it. it was wherever you end up because of this undertaking, you're on the hook, okay? Now, um, it seems to me um, that we can understand what's going on here much better once we see this. Look what it's called. It's actually called protection for Good Samaritan blocking. It actually is, and, and American jurisdictions have all these famous Good Samaritan laws, right? You, you, I assume you have them here where basically the structure of the common law and negligence is sort of nutty because if my wife's a physician, if we're driving down the road and she sees somebody needs emergency help, um, 
under the standard common law rule, if she just drives by, there's no potential liability for the death of this person or, or the exacerbated injury, but she stops to help, then she faces potential liability. And be, jurisdictions have realized this is one of these weird, uh, uh, one of these weird bad policy results of the structure of the common law. And so they've stuck in Good Samaritan statutes to say actually, you're protected as long as you're acting in good faith. There's not going to be a liability if you try to help. That's what this is. That's what the Communications Decency Act is. Um, and um, it's even clearer when you look at Section 2. But that is, that is the title of it. Um, so um, now there's a bit of a contradiction there, right? Because um, or maybe I should say what I've engaged in is a bit of a non sequitur. It, it doesn't, it still doesn't speak to the underlying question of whether an internet service provider who has not undertaken to do this will be uh, held liable, right? But it's pretty obvious what Congress is going to do. Um, it, once they're dealing with this wildly counter into, with this wildly counterproductive ruling that came from this Stratton Oakmont court in New York. Once they're dealing with it, they're going to have to figure out this sort of very difficult question of what to do on whether ISPs, internet service providers, or other people who might run bulletin boards or other things are going to be liable for failing to take down. And unsurprisingly, the rule they craft is a very pro is a very pro defendant one, and so in a sense, what we have is um, two is the core of it that came from Stratton Oakmont. We don't want this perverse incentive, uh, but um, it didn't make sense to put two in there without putting one in there first, which is basically we're going to treat you guys like common carriers, like phone companies. Um, I mean, it, it's not clear that that would be the sensible way to resolve it under the common law, but it's not surprising that when the whole industry rushes down to Washington to get a protective statute in the early 90s, that's what, that's what they crafted. No liability essentially for being, the, for being the conduit is what it's about, and the rule doesn't change just because you undertake to do this. So it seems to me that, that that's what the um, statute is about. It's, um, we were looking whether there was a chattels based affirmative duty to remove or an undertaking based affirmative duty to remove. And basically the statute says there's neither. That's what it's about. Um, so now um, when we look back to the the Nazi art case, Beitzel. Um, I think you can see what's going on here is that there's a massive difference under the statute between active and passive. The whole point of the statute was that there was no liability for, for being passive, for being the medium through which that does, and that result doesn't change just because you undertake to censor. That's the point of the statute. Uh, and um, it's not about people who are really publishing, who are really doing something. It's about people who are doing nothing uh, and the fact that they have uh, liability. Um, so therefore, there should be liability. Now, here's the interesting part, or one of the interesting parts. Um, which is the text is still pretty good for the defendants in these cases, right? I mean, they weren't making up the text. And the text says no provider user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. And what we now see in federal courts, and you can see this in, in the Ninth Circuit, um, I don't know if you can read that, it basically says that the whole question is, did you add anything new 
that's on your own. That's what it says, the Ninth Circuit says. That's how it interprets this. Um, and that's um, essentially saying there's no republication rule any longer. Um, so what will, I'm going to say a couple more things and then uh, move on to the broader, broader questions and then wrap it up. So um, it seems to me um, that there is imprecision in the statute. And um, I think you can see that the, what many people would call the natural reading, which I think is the wrong reading, is just not at all tenable. It's just way too broad. So you consider the following hypothetical. Google Inc. decides that one of their top executives um, may be doing something dishonest. So they hire a private, invest, uh, a private detective firm to look into various people at their top tier of management. And they get a, a confidential report from this firm that su such and such is selling Google secrets to another company and is visiting various prostitutes. And Google Inc. then publishes this on the internet. Okay? Now it seems to me under the literal reading of these courts, uh, Google Inc. faces no liability at all for this um, because the information came from another information content provider. It didn't come <coughs> from Google Inc. That can't be right. So part of the problem here is the use of the phrase information. Any information, it's not about information as such. It's about postings, right? Somebody does the act of posting something and you don't take it down, you are not liable as if you were that poster. It's not just about the information that's provided. Um, that is plainly going to lead to a reading that's so broad that no court would do it. So I, I think the textual reading of it, the other, the other um, uh, point I would make is by saying they shall not be treated as the publisher, you're, we're implicitly talking about a setting within which they're not actually the publishers. That's what we're talking. We're not talking about cases where they are in some very straightforward sense, the publishers. We're talking about the rest of it. It's, a, it's almost like um, a Gricean conversational implicature. When I say to somebody that, you know, um, Billy is like a brother to me. I mean, it's, it's implicit in some sense that Billy is not, in fact, my brother. Similarly, in this case, uh, what we're, we're not talking about cases where they are the publisher. All right, so let me just say a few more things. Um, so what has happened in jurisdictions that don't have a statute? Well, we can look both at the UK and at Canada for that. Um, here we have a relatively little case law on it, but um, it, it basically is pretty similar. Um, to uh, the UK, and it's pretty similar to what one would predict, which is that if it's clearly defamatory stuff, it's on a bulletin board for a while, a particular defendant has notice of it and has a special capacity to remove it, then in co courts, both in the UK and here, have been willing to treat uh, the defendant um, website operator, for example, um, or bulletin board manager, they have been willing to treat them as the defamers themselves if they have actual notice and an opportunity to take it down, and they don't. Interestingly, um, the, um, English, the main English case is Tamiz uh, versus Google, but the Defamation Act of 2013 um, changes the structure of the English law in a way that is um, arguably good for both plaintiffs and defendants, but in the end, I think it's better for defendants. Um, what it says is that uh, if you contact them, they have a duty to tell you who the defamer was. And in cases where it's not possible to identify uh, the defamer, then the ISP, Google, or, or the bulletin board operator would have a duty to remove it in the case of anonymous one. 
otherwise we're essentially transfer empowering the plaintiff to find the right person to sue and to get them to take it down. Um, excuse me. Let's see. Um, obviously, um, the most interesting case in Canada on this is the Crooks case, which is not exactly on point, but it's very close. And in a sense, what I've given you is context for that, because Crooks is a case, uh, how many of you know Crooks? It, do you study this? Yeah, okay. So Crooks is a case in which it actually looks like we don't need to go over to the nonfeasance side. It looks like we're in the misfeasance side. We have an act of publishing. We have something that's done, calling the reader's attention to it. So in some ways, it's quite interesting that um, Crooks um, comes out for the defendant. Uh, but I think it's complicated, as uh, many of these cases are, because it's not quite the case that providing the link, you're actually bringing the person right into contact with the defamatory statement. And I think uh, concurring, I don't remember which justice, but the most pro-plaintive justice um, in, in Crooks actually ruled that even if you went uh, with a pro-plaintiff line here in general, this particular case would not be successful because there was no proof that anyone actually clicked on the hyperlink. So I do think part of the question, even if we're in the world of misfeasance, is figuring out whether the, whether the third parties in whom, so to speak, the, the harm for the plaintiff resides, whether they actually were brought to make contact with it. Uh, these are some other interesting cases uh, that I've found in BC and Ontario on the same kind of issue, but we don't have time to talk about them. The larger theoretical issues I wanted to call our attention to is this, <coughs> are these. Um, why is there any responsibility associated with the failure to remove something defamatory? Um, as in, for example, the golf case where they don't take down the poem that accuses Byrne of being the snitch, assuming that it was defamatory to say that. And uh, in asking this question, uh, I, I'm not asking, I'm not suggesting that there is no responsibility associated with it or ought not be. Uh, I'm asking whether, why there is, if there is. And it seems to me um, that there are uh, two different ideas um, that, that we could draw upon, and I'm interested in, in your thoughts on this. One is that it's foreseeable that people are suffering harm and you have the causal capacity to stop them from suffering that harm by taking it down. And so um, it's, it's the fact that you are a, a, a causal link or your inaction is a causal link to the harm that someone is foreseeably suffering. That's one idea. But another idea that's really quite different is that um, if you leave it up long enough and it's on your place, that you're associating yourself with the meaning of it. You become one of the people projecting this message. You're sort of endorsing it. And what's interesting about Byrne versus Dean and many, many of the cases that focus on this difficult issue is there actually a pretty nice factual they're, they're, they're undeveloped facts built into the situation to suggest that perhaps there is endorsement. Certainly, the people who owned the clubhouse in Byrne versus Dean would have reason to be angry at someone they believed was um, the snitch. Um, finally, uh, I will say that in the United States, and um, I expect this is going to happen around of the world, um, the, the issue goes far beyond defamation. It, not, it goes far beyond privacy. In the United States, the Communications Decency Act has been used uh, to protect defendants against a wide range of statutory uh, and uh, common law claims. 
And the American courts have started to find a limit to that. Um, and with that, uh, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you.